This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here for another very, very interesting episode of Core Brain Journal with a terribly interesting guy who has metaphorically, but also more literally than any of us, has actually set foot on Mars. Get this. And he's going to talk about not only rocket science and Mars, but the evolution of thinking in terms of how we as human beings move ourselves forward in uh, maybe it looks contrarian, but it really is uh, evolutionary. And he's going to talk about the evolution of our thinking. So welcome aboard, Ozan Varel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chuck, for having me on. Appreciate it. So what I'm going to do is just do a brief uh, word from our sponsors, and we'll go into finding out exactly who you are. So Corporate Journal is supported by Direct Health Access Laboratory with over 3 million studies. They're deep leaders of experience with a big picture of measuring, for example, these molecular physiologic markers, methylation, cryptopyrrole, and copper challenges. They have a global service with a molecular focus, and if they can measure data in Nigeria, they can certainly help you out in Fargo. See more laboratory details here at dhalab.com forward slash core. And Core Brain Journal is also supported by the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center teams in Norfolk, Virginia, where they are addressing adolescent treatment failure nationally and internationally, wherein they provide residential care on an evolved family, interpersonal, and indeed global level. Check out their innovative and really comprehensive programs at barryrobinson.org forward slash core, C-O-R-E. So that's B-A-R-R-Y robinson.org forward slash core. So with that, I'm eager to introduce you folks to Ozan. He is such an interesting guy. So check this out, folks. He's a rocket scientist turned author and award-winning law professor. At heart, he's a contrarian. Through his articles and interviews, he shows how ordinary thinking produces extraordinary results, whether at work or at the next dinner party. The thousands who are members of his exclusive email list span multiple industries, including New York Times bestselling authors, lawyers, musicians, corporate executives, doctors, and constitutional court judges. But above all, they're pioneers and rebels. They have a passion for redefining the status quo and challenging deeply held views about how the world actually works. They know that they can't get ahead if they simply follow what others are doing, stay in the polemic stratosphere. Although the term contrarian is often used in the investing context, his website is not about investing. In those pages there, you'll find new ways of looking at old ideas from fields as diverse as art, astronomy, politics, and psychology. You'll learn from famous contrarians who excelled in life precisely because they refused to sing the same old tune and be with the crowd. So you don't want to miss out the contrarian handbook, Eight Principles for Innovative, pardon me, Eight Principles for Innovating your thinking. Now I'm going to tell you a little more about that's a that's interesting in itself, but I'm just going to uh, hum a few bars here. Uh, Ozan is a native of Istanbul, Turkey. He grew up in a family with no English speakers. He learned English as a second lang- language and moved to the United States by himself at 17 to attend Cornell University and major in planetary sciences. While there, he served on the operations team for the 2003 Mars Explorer rovers that sent two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, to Mars. He built stuff that went to the red planet and wrote code that snaps photos of the Martian surface. Folks, he was there. 
Then he walked away from it all, became a law professor to influence others to interplanetary leaps on this planet. Mm -hmm. He graduated first in his classroom law school, earning the highest grade point average in his law school's history since the introduction of the four-point grading scale. That one will roll your socks up and down. You can learn more about his journey. There's a specific article in Time that I'll have linked uh, in the show notes. So what an unbelievable CV. I mean, what an interesting thing. You, you have to tell us, just to go back for a few pages, what led you to actually, at 17 years old, take that big trip, make the big move, and decide to go into planetary physics? Well, first of all, thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction, Chuck. Um, so as for my life story and why I came to the United States, um, I have to tell your listeners a little bit more about the, the culture that I grew up in in, in Turkey. So Turkey is, um, more so than the United States, a very conformist culture. Um, so the educational system, for example, I remember when I was in uh, primary school, middle school, and beyond, the teachers called us by our numbers. So uh, they didn't refer to us by our first names. We were each assigned a number. So instead of, you know, Ozan, I was uh, 154. And, um, and the, the, the entire upbringing in the education system really reflected that mentality. Um, so education was all about rote memorization. Your path was predetermined. Uh, we took the standardized test when I was in fifth grade. It essentially determined your future. So it determined the, the middle and high school that you would go to. The, the better you performed on the standardized test, the better of a middle and high school you got into. And if you didn't get into a good enough school, then you didn't learn English. And, and so your opportunities in life would be, would be more limited. Um, and, you know, so you can imagine these uh, fifth graders showing up to this testing center that's given once a year, by the way. The test is only given once a year. You know, mm -hmm. carrying number two pencils and ready to regurgitate what their teachers told them to, to memorize. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, so that, um, and so that fostered this very conformist tendency in me uh, to just want to follow, to appease the authority figures. And over time, I developed this contrarian streak, essentially, as sort of a rebellion against that. Um, so I would spend a lot of time, for example, you know, in my room reading science fiction books. Uh, you know, when at a time when most of my friends had like swimsuit models on the posters <laughs> of swimsuit models on their walls, um, I had you know posters of Carl Sagan and Albert Einstein. So, <laughs> so I, that was sort of my escape from the imposed conformity that existed in in, in much of the the cultural and educational environment. And so, um, so America was sort of a an escape for me because in Turkey my path was predetermined, whereas in the United States the possibilities were infinite. And so that's when I really started to think seriously about um, about immigrating to America. Mm. So did you actually have some family over here? Uh, being 17 years old, it must have been difficult for your parents to let you go. And and then you know how, what was your structure upon which you were able to make that move? Sure, yeah, no, I did not have any family in the United States. Um, all of my family, I'm an only child. All of my family uh, was in Turkey, so I just you know packed up my suitcase and <laughs> and flew to JFK. Um, mm. And so I really didn't have a, a support structure at um, in the United States, and I had to fend for myself for quite a long time. So were you accepted to Cornell in Turkey? as a student uh, while you were still living there. So you came over and, and immediately attended Cornell? That's right, yeah. So I did all of the research myself, and I decided to come to America to, to study here probably when I was like 13 or 14 years old. Um, and I started to do some research on the different universities and different programs that existed here and, uh, and decided that I wanted to study astrophysics and that Cornell had a very good astronomy department. And so I told my parents that I was going to take this test called the SAT. I still remember the sort of this dumbfounded look that my mom had on her face. And she said something like, you're going to take the SAT? I hope that's not a drug, goes on. Um, <laughs> and I, I said, no, it's, a, you know, it's this test that I have to take to apply to college in the United States. So, so I figured that out. Um, 
yeah, before I before I arrived in the United States, and then I was accepted to Cornell, and um, and that's what brought me here. So then you got into, and, and while you attended Cornell, and this is one of the uh, very interesting aspects of, of your history, is even while you were attending Cornell, you began to be, you, you were actually involved in these Mar Martian projects. Absolutely, yeah. So I heard about the project actually before I even left for the United States. I was reading up on, you know, the latest on, um, on different space projects, and I noticed that there was this project called the Mars Exploration Rovers Mission, and it was supervised by a Cornell astronomy professor by the name of Stephen Squires, that en who ended up being my boss. I wrote to him before I even left Turkey saying, hey, you know, I know nothing about astronomy. Uh, well, I actually knew a little bit about astronomy, but certainly not enough to be able to really do anything meaningful, but I did know something about coding, I was really into computers growing up, and uh, I wrote to him and said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be able to work on this project, and um, he kindly wrote back to me, um, and we had an interview scheduled, I think, within the first, um, either the first week or the second week that I actually arrived in Ithaca, New York, uh, had the interview, he offered me the job, and it was like this pinch me now moment. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I will never forget it just because just two weeks before I was sitting in my room in Turkey, you know, sort of dreaming about space and watching like Apollo 13 was one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward two weeks, here I am, um, a member of the operations team for the Mars Exploration Rovers mm -hmm. mission. It really sort of solidified what I knew or what I expected about America being this land of opportunity, which is, you know, if you're willing to work hard, uh, if you're willing to, um, you know, take the initiative, that really the possibilities are are endless. Mm. What a statement about that uh, whole situation that is. I mean, it's fantastic. You you had to have some really excellent academic skills to pull that off in the first place. But and then you're so articulate. You know, you really have a way of expressing yourself that's so um, easy and comfortable and yet intelligent. So it was. I'm sure you interviewed very well in that. Of course, anything like that, you get a young person who has a, a long period of time with him and he's already at Cornell. I mean, it's a great, uh, a great opportunity for you and, and an opportunity for them to, to, uh, to be there with you in your growth. Absolutely. Uh, but I do have to credit Steve, my, um, my former boss, for essentially taking a chance on me. I'm sure he saw something, but still here's this random person from you know, Turkey applying for for a job, so uh, had it not been for his foresight, uh, my I think you know path might have would have been very different. It would have changed. So tell tell us all about the these two uh, rover opportunities, the Spirit and the Opportunity. I mean that whole that that whole idea of being there, taking the photographs. Were you coding for them, or what was your actual interrelationship with the uh, with the project? So officially, I was a member of the operations team, and um, and so these two rovers that were eventually named Spirit and Opportunity would send two robot geologists to explore the uh, the red planet. Um, initially, actually, let me back up a little bit because when I first started, our goal was to we were going to send only one rover to Mars, and um, but in December of that year, a different spacecraft. It was called the Mars Polar Lander was scheduled to touch down on the Martian surface and uh, we're watching, you know, the landing with excitement. Well, it, it didn't touch down on the Martian surface. The landing system malfunctioned. Um, and so instead of this, you know, soft, easy touchdown, this lander ended up plummeting into the Martian surface, joining the, the spacecraft graveyard <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that is Mars. So mm -hmm. from our perspective, this was a serious problem because we were planning to use the same landing mechanism that the Mars Polar Lander had used, and that mechanism had just failed spectacularly. Mm. Mm. So our mission was put on hold, and uh, you know, as we were sort of scrambling to find solutions um, that focused on alternative landing mechanisms, you know, how can we rectify this problem with the rover that we were planning to send? A question came up uh, that changed everything, and the question was, what if we sent two rovers instead of one? Up until that point, NASA had been sending just one spacecraft to Mars every two years, which is when the Earth is at its closest point to the red planet. 
Um, and so that was a status quo and a status quo is not easy to change. But when this question came up of sending two rovers instead of one, um, well, that was a way to essentially hedge our bets. So yes, mm -hmm. the landing system, of course, be replaced, but any number of things could go wrong when you're traveling, you know, 34 million miles through outer space. And so instead of putting all our bag, all of our eggs in one, one basket, one spacecraft basket, so to speak, mm -hmm. and crossing our fingers that nothing bad happens along the way, we decided to send two rovers instead of one. So even if one failed, the other might make it. And actually one of them is still going. Uh, we had designed these rovers to last for 90 days on the Martian surface. Uh, one of them is now close to 5,000 days into its 90 day mission, which is, uh, wow. which is pretty spectacular. It is unbelievable. It's amazing. And the pictures are so evocative. I mean, you, the thing that you're just like there, it's like you're, you know, in a American desert in a way, you have a certain sense of familiarity with aspects of the pictures. And yet it's uh, so many miles, so many million miles away. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Well, then how did you take it to the next step? Uh, you know, a little bit of what did you do there? Then actually what I'm going to do is take a break in a minute and ask you more details about the, the, the law transfer. But what did you learn about yourself in that situation when you were working with the team there and looking at what was going on with Mars and the whole relationship with astrophysics? What did you come to about yourself there? Sure. So I learned a, a, a number of different things. Uh, one was this analytical way of thinking that has stayed with me. Um, so even though I eventually made the switch into law and then academia, that way of thinking like a rocket scientist and that way of approaching problems stuck with me um, even, even after the transition. Um, the other thing that stuck with me just based on that story I just told you is uh, we tend to be, when we're solving problems, our first instinct is to just jump to solutions right away. Um, but problems often have multiple causes. And so when we rush to identify a solution, then this first definition of the problem sticks, even though it may not be the right problem to tackle. So in the example I mentioned of, of sending two rovers versus Mars, you, you know, the person who asked the question reframed the problem. The problem wasn't simply the landing mechanism. It was the inherent risk of sending this delicate robot geologist, you know, 34 million miles through outer space. And with the problem reframed, then we ended up with a different answer. So the answer wasn't simply use a different landing mechanism. The answer ended up being um, use less than two rovers instead of, of one. So that's just one example of, of a way of approaching some of these problems that still stuck with me. So even when I'm tackling a legal or a constitutional problem, that way of, of approaching the issue like a rocket scientist uh, I think still benefits me and and um, and uh, and it helps helps my thinking. Well, Ozan, to use the vernacular, it sounds like you get out of the box before you even frame the question. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. Because what's going on is you step back from the apparent problem and really redefine the problem effectively without necessarily coming up with a solution. You know, the, you know, re rethinking the, the, the fundamental basis of where you are. And, I, and that it really integrates with so much of what we're talking about here at Core Brain Journal because it's amazing to, you know, we two guys out of random, but I mean, this is what's going on over in neuroscience as well. It's like the issue has been, you know, people are based, uh, human beings are, are judged based on their appearances. You know, a sixth grader can tell another person is bipolar based on the criteria. So that, <laughs> that's the nature of not finding the answer, you know, if you're looking that way. But if you come back and redefine the problem is what in the heck are we actually talking about here? We have to send a number of rovers out there to figure out what's going on because the complexity is so deep that a surface label doesn't come anywhere near uh, defining what that actual problem is. Sure. There is a quote by Albert Einstein that I love where he says, you know, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes identifying the right problem and five minutes actually devising possible solutions. There you go. Sounds like systems two thinking, doesn't it? 
<laughs> right? <laughs> So good. Well, I'm going to ask you this question in just a minute. I, and the question that we're going to do before we take the break and to give you a chance to really think about it, because, you know, you have such a really interesting background and what a, what, what a diverse experience and what a, uh, an opportunity for you to learn so much about yourself and others in that team doing that complex work. The next question is uh, pretty natural. You can imagine what it would be is how did you make the change? What was, what were the, uh, sort of uh, what were the calling cards that drew you away from that very interesting astrophysics calling into the world of really law, interpersonal relationships, and, and to be way too uh, simplistic about it, the whole business of boundary setting and human relationships. Uh, so we're going to come back and ask you that in just a moment. We're going to take a brief break here, and we'll come back and see what you say about that one. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and, and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improved care, those next mandatory steps, should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school diagnostically from defiance to depression on every level for families, including military families internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living. How do we know? We refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing. So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash Core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful, cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's dhalab.com forward slash core. Well, this is so amazing, folks. You know, there's really, when you start talking to an individual like Ozan, you know, you, you, you feel like this could go on forever. And unfortunately, we only have a short period of time to tap his mind. I would encourage everybody here to make sure they get over to the eight principles for innovating, innovating your thinking. Uh, it seems like his email list is something we all need to be a part of because he is really much aligned with all the things that are happening in neuroscience and core brain journal activities. And the, this listening audience is really ripe for this kind of connection. So that's the first thing. And then the next thing would be, you know, what, what was the series of events or what was it within yourself that you became more, because you had to redefine who you were at that point. And what were the uh, variables that actually began to change your mind about who you were and where you were going? I loved working on the Mars Exploration Rovers Project. It was a life-changing experience for me. But I did not see a future in astrophysics. So to be able to do anything with that major, I would have had to go and get a PhD. And, and working on this project, I was in close contact with the graduate students in the astrophysics department at Cornell. And what they were doing didn't interest me. So um, I just could not picture myself you know, spending eight years um, looking at data. Uh, that, just was not, that just was not my calling. I wanted to be able to make an influence, um, have a real-world impact in some fashion. 
And so, so I had this, you know, existential crisis, probably my senior year in college. And at that point, I was looking elsewhere and, and figuring out my next move. And I took a course that was taught by a Cornell law professor. He only taught it to undergraduates. And I remember walking into the first class and the first case we studied was this case called Sullivan versus O'Connor about a botched nose job. <laughs> it was a patient suing her doctor about this nose job that had gone wrong. And the question was about damages, you know, how much do we award this, this woman? And that was like a breath of fresh air to me. Uh, after staring at, you know, equations and graphs for four years, that, that was something that I, was, I could see, sink my teeth into. And uh, I was hooked. At that point, I decided to think about a different path I decided to think about going to law school and becoming potentially an academic someday because I've always enjoyed teaching. And so, um, and, and I couldn't really do that in astrophysics without going and getting a, a PhD, which would have been um, a miserable experience for me. So I took a year off from, from uh, between college and law school and worked at a law firm in DC to make sure that I actually enjoyed, uh, I would enjoy being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And, and so I decided to then apply to, to law school. Yeah. A, a, a law firm in DC would have been the place to be for sure. There's so much, I mean, DC is such a vibrant town. There's so many interesting personalities and players in DC, uh, not only contributing, but watching each other. And, and I mean, all the, all the uh, innovative ideas in DC are just amazing. And then you have a very, um, uh, computer literate culture as well. So you have a very, uh, it's a bright, bright group up there. It must've been fun. It was great. Yeah. And uh, I worked at a, at a small law firm, which meant that uh, I was essentially treated like an attorney. <laughs> so, so I, I got to do many of the things that a, a junior lawyer might do, which re really gave me great insight into whether or not I would, I would enjoy the the day-to-day -day practice of law. Fantastic. Now, before I, I want to make sure that I cover one thing before we get to the close here. We're not, not near the close because I want to hear more about your law practice. But I also want to make sure that I help you go wherever you want to go. And I want to make sure that our audience connects uh, appropriately with you. And I'm, while we're talking, I'm also looking over my shoulder at your CV and, and what's going on here. So you have a couple of references let me understand, did you write a book or is this this particular uh, monograph or the, whatever it is, the uh, Eight Principles for Innovating Your Thinking, that's a handbook. Is that, what, is that the main connection that you hope people would make? Um, it's one of them. So that's a, that's a free ebook that you could download just by going to my website, which is okay. ozanbarrel.com. But the other book, which is an actual physical book um, that was published uh, or that will be published on November 7th is, is different. So that one is called The Democratic Coup d'Etat. Um, it's available right now for pre-order on Amazon and uh, Barnes and & Noble and your favorite uh, bookseller. Great. I will definitely put that on there. Now, tell us a little bit about what that one's about, if you will, please. Sure. So uh, the, this, this approach or, or, or my, my way of, of thinking, um, my nonconformist path carried itself onto academia as well. And so every piece of scholarship I wrote in academia challenged some conventional wisdom. And when I use the term contrarian, by the way, I want to make it clear that it's not just you know, contrarian for the sake of being a contrarian. It's, it's, I use the term in a more positive sense it, it, in the way that you're not simply taking the status quo for granted, but you're changing it in a positive way and offering a new, new path forward. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would reframe problems, ask what's missing, look for opportunities to innovate and find new ways of looking at old ideas. And uh, the book, The Democratic Coup d'Etat, is, is really an example of that thinking. So in a nutshell, when we think of military coups, we assume I mean, it conjures up these nightmare scenarios in our heads. So we assume um, that they're inevitably bad for democracy. We think of people like, you know, Augusta Pinochet or Muammar Gaddafi, who um, toppled democratically elected leaders and then they assume power for themselves to uh, run the country indefinitely. That's sort of the standard conception of what a military coup looks like. 
But as I was digging into, and this was instigated by the Arab Spring in 2011, as I was digging into the research on the issue and, and the military coups that have happened in history, I identified a pretty significant subset of military coups that didn't fit that pattern. So mm. these are coups that did the opposite. Instead of uh, toppling a democracy and establishing a dictatorship, they toppled a dictatorship and established a democracy. Mm. Uh, which is why I called the book The Democratic Coup d'Etat, because these coups uh, topple authoritarian leaders, the military runs the country for a year or two, and then the transition process ends with the free and fair elections of, of democratically elected leaders. Mm. You know, uh, the, and I'm sitting here while you're talking because uh, I wish I could uh, draw it up right now, but it's the whole idea of moving away from reductionistic, simplistic thinking is the background for it. But there's another recent author who was just on being the PDS, they, the, um, the podcast that they have at, uh, na on National Public Radio by, and his name is a German name. It's hate, I think. And he has, it has to do with uh, political and religious um, belief systems that keep us developmentally arrested. And I'll have it in the show notes, folks. It's not coming to my mind right now. Uh, are you familiar with who I'm talking about? No, but that sounds right up my alley. So I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> shoot you really when I when I get off here. I'll definitely look it up. I'll do it tonight because I've got some more interviews. But but I'll get it over to you because you would love this guy and you would love the podcast because you guys are brothers, no question about it. And he has a very interesting take on you know the evolution of humankind and and how uh, how he actually changed his way of thinking somewhat like you did. Not quite the same way, but similarly in the sense that he was looking at things that he could understand and lock down and have nailed down. And then uh, in the process, he began to look at that that whole uh, personal evolution of what was he really thinking about and where was he going with his life and then changed his thinking about his his uh, political convictions, mm -hmm. and uh, which is a, a big personal change. But his ration, rationality for the way he did it is, will be interesting to you and to the audience. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I look forward to checking his work out. So then let's talk about your work as a lawyer now and, and what you've found over there. Because what you've gone, if you, you've gone from deep mathematics and, and uh, data, as you said, into the world of human beings. And how does one tactfully and clearly and reasonably objectively define boundaries that that work and uh and i guess value from what you were saying a moment ago on the tort what's the value of the insult you know and uh so if you could say a few words about that whole experience i'm sure that would be interesting sure yeah i think uh, so i brought the the contrarian insights into my lawyer experience as well so i've, I've specialized as a, as a law professor on comparative constitutional law and uh, and that that com so I compare the constitutions of, of different countries in my in my scholarship and that's really I think informed by my background I mean in, in astronomy we always compared say star formation in different galaxies and so comparison came naturally to me and so we I would take a look at in my scholarship I have looked at how other countries approach the same constitutional problems that face the United States and how they have dealt with uh, with some of the uh, the issues that we're facing here um, mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah and everything I've written has been you know calling into question some some piece of conventional wisdom. I also brought I think those insights to my students as well and to my teaching, and so I've tried to deviate from the standard way of teaching at law school, which is you know a combination of lecture and Socratic questioning. And Socratic questioning is this method where, you know, the professor asks a question to a single student and the student answers and this fosters this dialogue, which can be useful. But usually when this happening, you know, one student, the, the student being questioned is, is listening while the rest of the class is falling asleep. And so, so I wanted to, um, to walk down a different path there as well. And so some of the classes I teach, I completely have altered my teaching methods and I run workshops. So I, I, I do group exercises, I give them interesting problems to think about and solve. 
as opposed to just lecturing, uh, which I think does a disservice to to students just because when they go out into the real world, really their their ability to thrive will depend on two primary questions. One is, can they lead? Um, and two is, are they able to solve complex problems? And so I think as teachers, as educators, we'd be well served to prepare our students to, to, to best be in a position to, um, to, to both lead and to solve complex problems. And so through the classes I teach, I try to instill those skills in my, in my students. You know, that is fundamental. I just read a quote. I was thinking about that without even knowing I was going to be speaking to you as uh, this past weekend, talking about, you know, the real value underlying uh, education. Uh, what are we really doing in education if we're doing it correctly? And we're really teaching about the thinking process, not the facts of the situation, but how do we arrive in this whatever new reality that the individual is in how do they think about that complexity and actually coalesce it in useful terms so that it works better for all concerned? Right, and and, and the facts are the facts are forgotten. Um, I, I don't remember what of much of what I learned in law school, but the way of thinking stays with you. Um, the way of approaching problems, the ability to work in groups, the ability to lead other people. So those are really important skills that, if installed properly in schools will uh, take you to, to places, uh, whereas rote memorization, lecturing can work perhaps in the short term, but it really doesn't instill you the, the type of values that we might want in, um, in future generations if we want them to be able to thrive in a rapidly evolving world, if we want them to be creative, if we want them to be able to think outside of the box, then the current approach to education, which was really designed to churn out industrial workers as opposed to um, to aspire people to, to dream big is is may not be the the best approach well you're so right because what happens is now I'm going to mention this you may or may not be aware of uh, Edward de Bono and six thinking hats are you aware of him no I'm not you're, you're gonna love it I'm telling you because it's right up your alley Edward de Bono was nominated for Nobel Prize in economics um, years ago, and he's a, uh, an individual who has uh, sort of planted his flag. He's an MD, PhD on the faculty of Harvard, Oxford, and the University of London. And he's brought all this business of group, group uh, relationships and group um, evolution. Group, group communication is the word I'm really looking for. Uh, into a manageable way. So he's, he's really taking, you know, things that are uh, what we experience in group process into a formal way of actually running a group effectively. Uh, because what happens in the group is so much different than just the rote. See what happens with the rote. It's a vertical management situation. I'm the, I'm the professor telling you what you need to do, kid. And if you get that right, you'll be great. And, and it all comes in a very vertically managed situation. But by the very nature of your putting everyone in a group and resolving the problem together, it's really the way these things actually more effectively get solved because there is that green hat thinking that De Bono will tell you about when you get into it, which is the creative way of thinking out of the box. There'll be some black hat people in there. You know, there are different hats that a person wears when they're actually thinking that unless they're aware of that hat, they, don't, they can't see its relevance to the resolution of the uh, problem in question. And uh, it's a lot of fun. You would, you would enjoy it. I'll tell you, I've got to write that one down too. Thank you for the recommendation. I will definitely, definitely check them out. But the thing I was really trying to drive at is what I see happen so often, and I think you're so accurate in this, and you just intuitively came up with it because you're thinking on the level of how do we take complex problems and deal with them uh, from the point of view of uh, drawing together solutions from the array of people who are educated in the matter. And, and putting people in a group process, basically. Now, we've seen this in psychiatry just as a by the by. So many psychiatrists are vertical managers because they've never worked in a group. So what happens is they're, you know, it's, and people have said, you know, it's a mom and pop situation. You go in there in the office and you're the authority in that room with that person. End of conversation, talk to you later. And then when they go to a meeting or they actually do a pre, they don't have any sense 
of what's going on in the group. I mean, I've been to meetings where my colleagues just chat loudly in the background, have no idea of who they are in the meeting and, and, and actually uh, disrespectfully uh, interrupting the, the very good presentation by the speaker because they've had an idea that they think uh, has merit and they're just talking out of turn with somebody. So that happens often. That's not once in a while. That happens quite often. So, and what happens is that group, the people who are there, haven't had the evolution necessary to really deal with the complexity of the human mind because they're thinking in vertical ways. They're thinking in uh, linear uh, reductionistic categorical ways. That's so interesting. And it's interesting that it's, I mean, I've observed this, of course, more, most acutely in my field of law, but that it extends to other fields like, like psychology as well. And I, I do think our education system is at least partially to, to blame for that. Um, not only, as you mentioned, Chuck, does, does the group process foster more effective thinking, uh, at least when done right? But on top of that, too, it's just the way that things operate in the, in the real world. I mean, we don't, we don't, when we're struggling with a problem, we don't tell ourselves, you know, this is a difficult problem. I'm just going to, I'm not going to ask anyone about it, or I'm going to try to figure out a solution all on my own. Um, it's just not how things work. Um, and so to the extent that we can get students, as difficult as it might be, um, to, to work in a group setting in a classroom before they go out onto the real world, I think would be, uh, we'd be doing them a service. No question about it. That's so, so well said. Now, we're winding up with our time here, but I would like to formally invite you, and you don't have to accept at the moment, but the issue would be, I think it'd be a lot of fun to have you back because it sounds like your book is going to have some political turmoil around it uh, just by thinking about the subject without even getting into it or reading it. It sounds like it's going to be very interesting because so much turmoil is going on in D.C. the way it is, and and there's so much room for improvement in the way we deal with problems, report on them, manage them. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so we'll, we're inviting you back formally. And you, again, you don't have to accept it right now. But before we close, Ozan, tell us where you would like people to go and connect with you, please. Sure. So my email list is really the best way to, to connect with me. And, um, you know, I, 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 you'll have my personal email address. You'll get a newsletter from me every week with a new article. And uh, on top of that, too, I put together a package of goodies for your audience, Chuck. So um, I'll give them a, uh, the Contrarian Handbook for free and then the, the first chapter from my forthcoming book for free as well. And so to get those two things and to join my email list, all they have to do is to text my first name. So that's Ozan, O-Z-A-N, to 345345. So once again, that's my first name, Ozan, O-Z-A-N, two, three, four, five, three, four, five. And then they'll get the, um, like I said, the Contrarian Handbook and the first chapter from my book for free. And I'll add them to my email list as well. That is ridiculously easy. I mean, everybody listening to this has to get on it because it would be so, so interesting. I mean, and uh, I keep thinking of these other things to, uh, to connect with you on, and I'll shoot, shoot it to you when we get done. I'll include some of them in the, in the show notes. I don't want to steal that thunder. That is really good. So it's Ozan, O-Z-A-N, 345-345. And, and then what you'll do is leave your email, and yep. uh, you'll be on the list. It sounds terrific. I'll do it before I go home tonight. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. And I do look forward to speaking with you again. It's very, very interesting. And we really appreciate the variety of realities that you've dealt with. And really, you're still a young guy. You've got a lot going in, in a very short period of time. So we just really appreciating the, appreciate you taking the time to meet with us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on, Chuck. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Cobrain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start 
ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.